hello good evening uh, to all uh, all doctors uh, a warm welcome to wire scientific program webinar uh, today we have with us a renowned doctor from chennai dr arun n dr arun n is working as a gastroenterologist and hepatologist at uh, apollo main hospital chennai creams road and uh, he is also director for the chandra gastro liver and clinic endoscopic center in chennai and his interest areas are transplant uh, post liver transplant immunosuppression guidelines and plasma peresis in aclf and is a lifetime member in isg in cell sgei and iap today he is going to take us through uh, scientific program of emerging options for the management of chronic hepatitis b and navigating treatment landscape and uh, doctor has uh, completed his MBBS from Rajamuttaya Medical College, Annamalai University, Chidambaram, and he has uh, pediatrician. Uh, he has completed his DNB pediatrician from Indira Gandhi Government uh, Hospital, Government Hospital from Puducherry, and he has completed his DM from Stanley Medical College from Chennai. And now, uh, doctor is going to take us through scientific program on. Emerging options for the management of chronic hepatitis B navigating treatment landscape. Sir, warm welcome to you, sir. Please take us through the programs. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, respected professors, senior consultants, and dear friends. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to discuss with you all in this wonderful evening about one of the most complex entity in the field of hepatology to tackle hepatitis B virus. As we all know, hepatitis B virus will be having a wide varied presentation. It can take acute hepatitis like presentation. It can present like chronic hepatitic form. It can transform to hepatocellular carcinoma. It can transform to other organ system environment. So to tackle this hepatitis B, what are the major emerging line of therapies? What are the newer therapies being available right now in the field of gastroenterology to discuss about that for the next 30 to 40 minutes? My discussion will be going on in that area. So to briefly about the introduction, as we all well know, it's one of the parenterally. And if you are going to look into this hepatitis B virus, it's one of the major concern health problem. More than 350 million population throughout the world been affected by this event. So if you are going to look from 1990 till 2005, almost around 3.7 percent of the uh, 4.2 to 3.7 decline will be there. But even after vaccination and good amount of viral suppressing drugs, still the event is still progressing. And there are so many new hepatitis B uh, patients are being reported, and it is being well established that it's been going for chronicity. And if you're going to treat this condition, long-standing therapy, adherence to the molecules, various complications. How are you going to target the patient? Who are all the patients going to be subject to this therapy? So much of questionable issues are there to target about this hepatitis B management. So as we all know, the treatment is still handicapped with regards to the permanent curative intent. Regarding the prevalence of this hepatitis B virus, it will be going for a high to intermediate to low state prevalence for carrier rate of around 8 to 20, 8 to 20 percent for the low prevalence rate will be around 0.22 percent and low and high prevalence area will be around in Southeast Asia and China and predominant mode of spread. It's mainly by perinatal will be going for most of the time for chronicity around 90 to 95 percent of the population and also by sexual and percutaneous mode of transmission will be reported because of this hepatitis B viruses. And there are so many newer definitions have been there to take on this hepatitis B virus discussion. And the one potential target nowadays for us to discuss about this CCD DNA is a covalently closed circular DNA. What is the potential? If I just want to, mean, to this area to be addressed, that's the main concern. And how are you going to address this development? And what is the life cycle for this hepatitis B virus? That is the main area for me to progress my discussion right now. So, what is this functional cure? What is this complete cure? If you're going to look into this functional cure, which means 
functionally it is going to be cured but it's not going to be having a permanent cure for example your anti hbs antibody levels will be positive your hbs age is going to become negative but even then your ccc dna is going to be still persistently positive so once your ccc dna if it is going to become negative followed by your anti hbs antibody if it is going to be positive that shows evidence of a complete cure but most of the time this phenomenon will be a uncommon scenario when you going to treat a patient with hepatitis b virus so what is the basic structural integrity what is the basic structure is one of the complex phenomena as we all know it's mainly by a dna virus if you're going to look into that there are four main viral rna and four open reading frame of proteins and there are various transcriptional templates for this hbs ag to be integrated to discuss about that what are the four major viral rna based upon this pre see mainly based upon the various uh, i mean K, I mean, 3.5 KB, 2.4 KB, 2.1 KB, and 0.7 KB. There are various, I mean, 3.5 KB is mainly for pre genomic RNA. And if you're going to and if you're going to look into this 2.5 is mainly for the HBV structural mRNA and 0.7 KB is mainly for HBV X protein relationship and minor RNA species will be there. And if you're going to target this protein, there are various proteins like C, P, S and X. So what is this? It do not, the common functional, the common event about this proteins, it do not align with viral mRNA and overlap is always will be the in alternate, alternate reading frames and it will be difficult to eradicate this antiviral, I mean, understand this antiviral mechanism. And there are various transcriptional templates will be available. And if you're going to look into this, this core proteins, nothing but HPC, IgA, antigen, and next to that is an envelope black proteins like large, middle, and small, followed by the polymerase, uh, DNA polymerase, and reverse transcriptase, one of the two major enzyme activity, which has been predominantly involved in the structural function of this hepatitis B virus. And the transcription activation is mainly by H. X, which is being mainly implicated in the pathophysiology to discuss about hepatocellular carcinoma. So if you're going to look into this diagram, see uh, what is this is the HPV genome is mainly housed in a capsid structure. So I'll be taking on my discussion about the life cycle. So what is going to happen is being housed in a capsid structure, which is being predominantly formed by HPV core proteins. As we are discussed with you all, large, middle and small size HPS fragments will be there. And this NTCP binding domain is going to be adverse in there. What is this NTCP binding domain? It's nothing but sodium chloride peptide binding domain is going to be present in the pre S1 region, which is being more important for this HPV infection to carry on. This is about the basic life cycle. See what is going to happen for this HPV, HPS AG, I mean for this hepatitis B virus to cause the major infection. So once the hepatic B, hepatitis B virus is going to infect your hepatocyte. So if you're going to look into the structure, it's mainly by a DNA. That's why it's called hepatinovirus. So hepatinovirus is mainly what is going to happen in that. It's mainly in read two enzymatic pathway, one by reverse transcriptase and one by DNA polymerase. All those things will be involved in that. So for this hepatitis B, the mainly capsid coated area for this viral entry to happen, it has to be having an NTCP receptor based entry uh, followed by the nuclear capsid is going to get released into the pathway. And once it's going to release, there will be evidence of your close covalent, I mean, covalently close circular DNA formation will be there. And this will be forming a episomal. Once it's getting entering into the nucleus, followed by it will be converted, it will be taken over by your microtubules, it will be entering into your cytoplasm, and followed by the exocytosis and release into your bloodstream will be happening with this kind of viral event. So once it's going to enter into your uh, nucleus, is what is going to happen as I discussed with you the various I mean, genetic manipulations going to happen followed by the various genome I mean, see this is mainly by reverse transcriptase but that's what see what do you mean by reverse transcriptase when transcriptase transcription is mainly for RNA but here with the DNA so that's why involved in this formation so the transcription pathway once it's going to set in there will be evidence of multiple fragments will be there like 3.5 k 
2 mean KB of pre core mRNA and 3.5 KB of pre genomic RNA and mRNA. These are all the various targets. Why I have been highlighting on these areas when you are going to take on this discussion because these are all the various newer targets when you are going to target a patient with chronic hepatitis B viral infection to be discussed as per the latest ASLD guidelines statement what they mentioned. So this is all followed by this pre-genomic RNA followed by this pre a uh, small fragment mRNA all those things this HPV HPX pattern of mRNA all those things is going to export and translate into a cytoplasm once it's going to get export and translate into a cytoplasm what is going to happen it will be going to enter into the cytoplasm followed by ex exocytosis pathway it is going to get released into your bloodstream this is how by a DNA polymerase based enzyme which is going to get involved that the recycling priming all those things is going to set in followed by this patient is going to get released with this HPV co and uh, HPE all the MT viral and P pre genomic RNA recycling RNA all those things if it is going to release into the bloodstream with this by exocytosis process and this diagrammatic representation about the pathophysiology what is going to happen what are the various phases of this hepatitis b virus nowadays being reported see as we all know the initial four phases what have been reported about the natural history of this viral event is mainly by immune tolerant and immune reactive inactive clear carrier as well as HPV negative and HPV negative phase variable as these are all the various older concepts being there but now the main two area to discuss is, is nothing but take for consideration whether the patient HPS AG positive along with HPE AG whether it is positive or whether it is negative if the patient is HPE AG positive we need to see whether the patient is having evidence of chronic HPV infection or whether the patient is having evidence of chronic hepatitis B what is this chronic hepatitis B infection if you're going to look into that the ALT level will be predominantly normal in chronic HPV infection and the DNA is going to be high and HPSAG is also going to be high followed by the liver disease will be low or none to minimal in case of chronic hepatitis B virus infection. But what is going to happen once the patient is going to be having a phase of chronic FB, there will be high level of ALT, inflammatory activity is going to set in, followed by the DNA target is going to be high and the liver disease is going to be moderate or severe. And here in this phase, the zero conversion started going to happen from your HPAG reactive phase two your zero conversion is going to take on from this for so what is going to be when the patient is going to be hbe is negative so it's been it has been divided by chronic hbv infection and chronic hepatitis b so chronic hbv infection in the background of hbe is negative status the liver disease will be minimal and alt will be normal and hbv dna will be always Thousand. Once a patient is going for chronic AB, the HB DNA is slightly more than 2000, ALT will be high, the liver disease may be moderate to severe to progress further. Once a patient becomes HPS AG negative, which one of the rarest scenario to happen, which means it shows a so resolve HBL infection, but we need to look for other pointers also. And once the patient is becoming HBSH negative, and when the patient is becoming HBV DNA undetectable and ALT normal, which means the patient is going for HBSH negative phase of reactions. This is a basic diagram. Once again, I'm being representing about the phases of chronic HBV infection, as what I mean discussed from a EASL portion statement of Journal of Hepatology 2017 guidelines. So what is this HBSAG zero clearance? So spontaneous HBSAG zero clearance will be, as I, as I discussed with you, it's one of the rarest events to report in the background of chronic FB, but various studies shows that annual incidence of HBSAG zero clearance will be around one to two percent, but HBSAG was associated with, as I discussed, will be having predominantly low baseline HPV DNA levels once the patient is going for HPS AGC clearance and the risk of progression to epitocellular carcinoma will always be less and will once the patient is going to have HPV particles it's going to predominate it can inhibit the innate immune response in your epitocytes which may lead to decreased expression of your various antiviral cytokines. So HPV particles has to be come down if you want to target the therapy for this condition. And next to that, 
what so if you're going to look into this statement hbs ag loss after therapy if you're going to switch on to various molecules what that the patient is going for hbs lazy loss if you're going to look into this graph see if you're going to see this loss of hbs ag is the most reliable indicator to measure the functional cure and if you are going to see HPS AG zero clearance, that's a disc you that is an associated reduced risk for hepatocellular carcinoma and it contributes. So once HPS AG is going to contribute for your deregulation of your both innate and unhappy immune response is going to be uh, involved if you're going to have HPS AG positive status in this study. In the background of HPEAG positive, in the background of HPEAG negative patients, 11 persons who have been treated almost with pegylated interferon after four years, that shows evidence of HPEAG loss. And 10 percent uh, after five years of tinofovir, you know, that shows evidence of loss. And in the HPEAG negative patients, if you are going to treat for 11 persons, we'd be showing evidence of loss even and no HBS loss was absorbed after two years of chinophobia in the background of HBEAG negative patients. So in this so the HBS AG loss is one of the target for therapy but it is one of the complex things to be achieved in the management of hepatitis B. So if you're planning to treat a patient with hepatitis B, what is the common thing? The one rule for treating hepatitis B is there are no certain rules. You can follow any guideline as per your position thing, position statement, what you're going to consider based upon your clinical parameter, based upon your virological scenario, based upon your histological response, based upon your biochemical parameters, based upon your clinical presentation, all these things to be taken into account. And you need to see whether the patient is having evidence of response serially you need to monitor the patient and three months six months even if you're not going to start the treatment for the patient of hepatitis b virus serial monitoring of your necroinflammatory activity serial monitoring of your biochemical parameter with your alt all those things has to be ascertained if you're managing a patient with chronic fb so what are the timing of milestones say if you write from 1992 right from the beginning from interferon from up to chinophobia right from 2008 right from 2012 chinophobia alphabet have been taken over now the future is still going on with immunogenetic based therapy and based upon your ccd dna and based upon your rna inhibition factor all those newer things newer markers like hbv core antigen assessment and hbv rna assessment all those newer markers can be taken into account if you are going to manage this hepatitis b if the patient is going for chronicity to brush up your basic knowledge about the nucleoside and nucleotide analogs what are the various drugs being available like lamivudine telbuvudine and enchikamai so if you're going to look into that predominantly we'll be using either enchikamai or chinofovir or nowadays even for chinofovir alafenamide if you're going to consider and this is how the basic approach and basic dosages you all should remember if you're going to switch on to a patient with enchikamai once the patient is going for a cirrhotic background we can go at a dose of around one milligrams the non cirrhotic background the early phase in only the background of chronic fb we can go at a rate of around 0.5 milligrams daily and based once the patient is going for chino four way based upon the age criteria based upon your clinical presentation whether the patient is pregnant or not all these things has to be ascertained followed by we can start the patient on chino four way either 300 milligrams or dose daily and alaflamide at a rate of around 24 milligrams all those things can be considered but this is the outline by my, my main area to discuss with you all the current treatment challenges, what are the various limitations being still available. See, what is the problem? Even if you're going to subject the patient, how long you're going to treat the patient, how are you going to monitor this kind of patient? How do you assess the response to treatment? Whether it is, how do you going to come to the conclusion whether it is primary non-response scenario? There are so much of definitions being available as well. If you're going to look into various guidelines like Apacel, if you're going to look into the guidelines of ASLD, all these things have been given, but that's not the main area for me to take on the discussion. But mainly you need to know the limitations are the nucleotide inhibitor. If you're going to use like chinofovir and chikamwe, it will not act on predominantly, it doesn't suppress your CCCD in nucleus and it will be unable to clear the virus completely so you couldn't able to achieve the complete HBS AG negative status most of the time and uh, you may need a prolonged and indefinite therapy so adverse effects have certainly been reported and the most common challenge is to elimination of your nuclear CC DNA which is nothing but 
a non replicating dna that can exhibit stability equal to the lifespan of your hepatocyte so if you're going to look into this ASLD basic guidelines, if you're going to see whether the patient is HbA-AG positive, how to initiate the treatment. So in the background of HbA-AG positive patient, so when you're going to see HbA-AG positive, see whether the patient is having two times of the upper limit of ALT. And if the HbA DNA, if it is going to be more than 20,000, definite indicator for you to start the patient for treatment, even in the background for HbA-AG positive. But once the patient is having low normal ALT, HbA DNA, even if it's still I, definitely we can wait, watch and monitor for a zero conversion. And you can monitor the patient every one to three months for this kind of therapy. And once the patient is going to be HBE, in the background of HBE is negative. In the background of HBE is negative, see whether the patient is going for chronicity is the main motive. And once the patient, even if the DNA is going to be more than 2000, in the background of ALT to be more than two times of your upper limit of normal, which means you need to start the patient for treatment. So what is this ALT consideration? So if you're going to look into this FASL statement, if you're going to look into the ASLD guidelines, the, I mean, the criteria like 29 to 35, all those things will be given, but FASL is tightly in the higher range, around 40, have been given for this ALT criteria to measure the normal brain but you can always consider the patient once it's progressing to two times of upper limit of normal with strong positive HBA DNA more than 2000 definite indication in the background of HBE AG negative patients so if the ALT is going to be uh, less than 2000 and ALT I mean uh, HBA DNA if it is going to be less than 2000 and ALT if it is going to be less than the upper limit of normal always we can wait monitor the patient serially usual monitoring will be three months to six months in the initial phase followed by on annual monitoring can be done if you want to treat the patient with hepatitis b so how to target this patient for hepatitis b virus treatment before i'm going to take on what are the various newer concepts being available in the model management of hepatitis b you should understand the various reason targets this has been taken from a American position statement guidelines. What I mentioned in that, if you want to treat this various milestones, you now up to six milestones, you need to attain for this HBV complete uh, to I mean uh, complete eradication. So main thing, you need to target the first. You need to target a decline of HBV DNA. Step two will be your HBE AG and your anti HBV zero conversion followed by your step three will be HBV DNA as to death decreased to undetectable levels. And the milestone four will be the clearance of your HBS AG. And your milestone five will be the clearance of CCC DNA. That's one of the most complex area to understand. And we are being targeting our therapies in this phenomena right now. And once a patient is being having clearance of cells, even your cells is going to get clear with integrated DNA sequences. That means you are attained the entire milestone. You have reached the position six in this area. So you will be going for a functional cure to absolute cure. This is what you are going to look into your patient when you are going to treat the patient with hepatitis B. These are all the various six milestones which have been taken from the recent paper to be looked into the account for managing a patient with chronic FB. So. Taking on to the newer line of therapies, apart from your basic nucleotide molecules, what are the various newer molecules can be considered in the management of chronic FB? What are the various trials being considering? If you're going to look into that, the main thing is mainly by blocking your sequential therapy, as we have been discussing with your combining nucleotide analogs with your interferon-based therapy along with your entry inhibitors like Meclodex B and therapeutic vaccination trials and TLR7 agonist and various RNA inhibitors which is being right now available. If you are going to look into the sequential therapy with interferon based regimen, so what is the thing which has been given most of the studies, uh, what are the most of the studies if you are going to subject for a period of around 20 weeks, if you are going to give lamivudine now followed by interferon, all those if you're going to subject the patient for a for a longer duration of time, most of the time the duration of interferon therapy is only six months. Uh, also, the antiviral use by the weakest, the only one done with NGKVR and shown better response. So always, if you're going to use this interferon-based regimen to start with NGKVR when you are planning for sequential therapy is one of the most important consideration for these things to go on. So. Sequential therapy with NGKWA followed by the combination with pegylated interferon shows better HBS-AG clearance 
and HPV DNA control, but only in a specific population of patients with chronic HPV, which shows predominantly high viral load and HPV phenotypes apart from your D and E. Because, and if you're going to look into this, there might be evidence of poor childability to interferon, which makes it less attractive and not part of any standard guidelines as of now has been taken out from the 2010 paper from uh, Sonovel et al. So if you're going to look into this, there are, if you're going to see this one most important diagram which shows the entire new targets for your various new molecules to consider is nothing but for entry inhibitors, CCC DNA inhibitors, your epigenetic inhibitors, your translation inhibitors, your capsid inhibitors, your reverse transcriptors inhibitors, your Secretion inhibitors are immunomodulators being most important nowadays, which you consider in the management of the apparatus being various newer trials are being going to what they mentioned in that. We're going to see this HBV wine on if it is going to be for double stranded DNA along with the DNA parameters, the reverse transcriptors activity is going to enroll the CCD DNA once it's going to get amplified as I discussed with you the transcription translation your real transcript is in involved followed by it is going to get secreted into this area if you're going to look into this nucleus followed by cytoplasm migration the major target if you're going to see what is in this area the entry point the entry point of this virus the entry inhibitor what you're going to discuss nothing but microlex B so if you're going to see this microlex B is not it's a synthetic lipopeptide which derived from pre S1 domain of the HPV envelope protein. So if you're going to look into that, this H, I mean, as I discussed with you, the sodium charocolate peptide entry site, which is going to be get blocked, which is going to get inhibited. So the specifically it's going to target your hepatocytes, as I discussed with you by NTCP pathway, it's going to block geno HPV infection. So potentially it can prevent intra your it can prevent your intrahepatic viral spreading even after infection has occurred. So if you're going to look into this state right now, as we are taken from the best of ASLD guidelines from 2018 statement, in this patient with so if you're going to leave a look for the data of chronic delta hepatitis being HDV co-infection with HPV. This evidence of metrolytes B shows a better prominent risk. See, in this study, they have been subjecting the patient with 180 mil micrograms of pegylator interferon along with metrolytes B, 2 milligrams daily or even 5 milligrams or a combination therapy uh, for 14 weeks. If you're going to look into these various things, what they've been going to happen uh, if you're going to look into that, the combination therapy shows a strong synergism on this HPV DNA, HPV, I mean, hepatitis D virus related RNA, and also induce profound HBS AG declines in a substantial number of patients. So, so you're going to target about your HDV levels also, it's going to have a potential decline in your HPV levels also, if you're going to have in this uh, entry point inhibitors of Meclolex B. As you are going to look into the discussion further, this CCD DNA persistence is one of the most complex problem uh, for relapse of any viral activity, even after cessation of your nucleus inhibitor. So that's why there is high progression. Even if you stop the molecule, there is high progression for you to go for epitocellular carcinoma and other transformation can happen. Though there are previous animal studies being shown that Microlex B does not reduce its nuclear CCD DNA, but intrahepatic dissemination definitely is going to get blocked both cell to cell and also from extracellular environment. And it, even then, if it is not going to target the viral proteins, it may address the cellular component of your hepatocytes to prevent its interaction with HPV, thereby shows the resistance is unlikely with this Microlex B. And other, what are the other molecules being tried like this metrolex B as an entry point like inhibitors, for example, cyclosporine, ritonavir, esichimab, and van vanipricin and ibesachan, all these things have been tried in making an attempt to block this HPV, this hepatitis B virus entry uh, into the site. 
This is a basic flow chart, basic diagram to analyze what are the various open breeding frames or genomic proteins or four main viral RNAs and four main open breeding frame proteins that's been looking into the background as I discussed with you the various transcription templates for this HBS AG to play a role that has been taken over from the recent paper. The overlapping RNA, mRNA and one of enable targeting multiple HBS genes and proteins with single RNA inhibitor trigger. So we need to target these areas if you want to uh, if you want to do a successful hepatitis B virus eradication in the upcoming areas. So to discuss about this CCD DNA. So what is a CCD DNA? If you're going to look into this graph, say once again is get entry, once it's going to get entry into the nucleus based upon your RC DNA, that shows evidence of CCC DNA formation and from that the transcription pathway activity is going to get formed into that. Followed by translation next to me exercises before it's going to set in we are going to block this pathway by CCD DNA inhibitors. What is this CCD DNA if you're going to look into that? It is predominantly in low copy numbers which is being occurring and if you're going to look into that it is a nuclear mini chromosome like moiety and it's predominantly a transcription template which synthesized from your genomic DNA sequence and it may replicate capsule capsid associated DNA and what are the major limitations if you're going to look into your current treatment it couldn't able to see when you're going to treat the patient failure to eliminate the pre-existing CC DNA pool or pre uh, prevent CC DNA formation from trace levels of wild if you're going to look into that the wild chip virus or mutant virus what are the things which is being available there is some possibility for or you even with the CCDA formation cannot be able to prevent it from the trace levels which is going to set in in the formation. So the CCDNA formation which is being predominantly involved in your various nuclear capsid transport, your removal of viral polymerase, your RNA, RNA primering and your DNA sensing, your viral anti-sensing, all these things which have been predominantly involving by this CCDNA pathway and followed by that's why the various new molecules right now even ISG guidelines, what they've been mentioning to that for Professor Swelling's statement, they have been mentioned about this HPV RNA, even for research purposes nowadays, even being tried, which is being more complete formation, more complete detection to look for this CC, CCC DNA, HPV RNA to mark, to analyze a marker for this and also your HPC chrome, I mean, uh, I mean correlated antigen, that's also one of the strong marker, various other new markers to be considered if you want to manage a patient with chronic hepatitis B. And what does this small interfering RNA is? If you're going to see in this, as I discussed with you, the various RNA release is going to happen once the patient is going to get from CCC DNA, the small interfering RNA followed by your PG RNA, which is pre-genomic and followed by your messenger RNA is going to get involved in this pathway these are all the various small interfering proteins, small interfering RNAs, which is going to involve in this transcription to translation to set in. So this small interfering RNAs, if you are going to get blocked, what is going to happen? There is so some evidence that re replication intermediate, the pre-genomic RNA, these are all could be able to downregulate the expression of your various viral RNA related proteins. So what is going to happen? Once a viral load and viral proteins is going to come down, that results for well, this reduces and the viral proteins can result in disease. Polymerase, polymer based system for the targeted therapy of your small interfering RNA to the hepatocyte cytoplasm, which reduces the potential toxicity. So all the small interfering RNA is going to act. If you're going to look into this mechanism, see it is having a predominance. If you have, this is how your, I mean, your nicotine analogs is going to act followed by in this diagram, if you're going to look at this small interfering RNA, it is going to block mRNA pathway, thereby reducing your viral protein production, thereby reducing your viral antigens, which will be predisposing to reversal of immune suppression. And once the patient is going to a reversal of immune suppression, that shows evidence of HPSAG zero conversion, and definitely that, that shows evidence of functional cure for this kind of patient to set in. So what is this small interfering RNA? There are various papers. If you are going to look into this 2014 statement by UN et al, what is the many ARC520? If you're going to see into this, this small interfering RNA, it is going to have a conjugated with cholesterol and a polymerase-based system with N-acetyl galactosamine. So if you're going to see, there are two wires in this. One is wild one and one is wild two. There's wild one, so ARC520, 
nutrients contained in Leo flies powder, which is being predominantly containing a mass hepatocyte. See, this area today is more of biochemistry oriented part of description because these are all the newer lines of therapy, new emerging therapies that what been considering, and still we are on the research area to analyze this concept. So more of phase trials, more of clinical trials, more of biochemical aspects. That's the main area for us to take on the discussion right now. So if you're going to leave, if you're going to use this ARC 520, what you're going to see, and there'll be dose of around 2 milligrams per kg. If you're going to substitute this patient, there may be result in HPSAG reduction up to 50 percentage and significant reduction is going to maintain for case. If you're going to use monthly injection of this ARC 520 in combination with the standard therapy, that might be achieving a multi-long reductions of your HBSAG concentration in the background of HBAG constipation that persisted for months after discontinuing therapy. So that shows evidence that your ARC 520 is going to have a potential role in the upcoming area for discussion. And next to that, what is this pre-genomic packaging that I've been discussing with you? If you're going to look into the same slide, this CCC DNA formation from there, once the transcription pathway is going to set in, pre-genomic RNA and mRNA is going to involve, followed by X encapsidation is going to be set in, followed by reverse transcription activity, and your exercises is going to take on. And once the CCD DNA is being serving as a template for this pre-genomic RNA and this messenger RNA. So once the messenger RNA it is going to get translated, that have been discussed, your X protein, HBSAG, various predominant surface proteins are going to get released. The capsid, which is being created by multiple copies of this core proteins, which is going to be get combined as been showing in this uh, previous diagram and followed by your capsule, I mean, your capsid inhibitors in this area, that's encapsidation, the capsid inhibitors also is going to have a predominant role followed by, if you're going to discuss on this pre-genomic RNA, I mean, uh, RNA packaging. So what is this capsid assembly inhibitor? That's what been discussed. This is how, if you're going to block this pathway, your capsid assembly is going to completely block down by your translational activation is going to come down and followed by what is going to happen for your capsid assembly there are two classes. The first class is what's going to promote a capsid assembly, but inhibit the entry of pre-genomic RNA. That's what I've been shown. So the pre-genomic RNA couldn't be able to enter. It's going to inhibit the entry. And for what is this decreased capsid? It shows a normal geometry, but uh, normal geometry and size, but the nucleic acid will be predominantly empty. There are various examples, phenylpropanamides and sulfamide derivatives are there. The second class will be predominantly directly in with the correct formation of the nucleic acid, which having a virus particle that are deformed with abnormal structure and appears to be not infectious. So it can inhibit your virus, that inhibit the correct formation of the nucleic acid directly. So the example predominantly will be a tetraaryl diadropyridines can be considered. And if you're going to look into this, uh, this capsid inhibitors like ABI, HO07, a novel co-inhibitor, what you're going to consider, See, if you're going to subject the patient for a dose of around various trials, 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams, 300 milligrams, this, this uh, ASLE 2000 push, 2018 statement, what they mentioned that once you're going for a dose of around 400 milligrams, so the HPV declines of up to four longs are seen over a period of uh, 28 days, the HPV RNA, HPV RNA also is going to get declined correlates with your HPV DNA also going to get declined. So you're going to target your HPV RNA, you're going to target your CCD DNA, and you're going to target your HPV levels also. All these things is going to come down if you're going to use this NOVA core inhibitor that has been proven in various trials that have been discussed. And this is another paper what they've been taken from ASLD statement, the safety, pharmacokinetic and antiviral activity of JNJ 561, uh, 6379, what have been mentioned in that. So in patients with chronic AB, what you are going to see is a capsid modulator. If you're going to treat in the background of non serotic treatment name, HBAG positive or negative patients or a period of 28 days, we are going to have a serial follow up. So what they've been mentioned in that, so that shows to be a safe and well-tolerated effect, a dose-dependent pharmacokinetic 
and exhibited potent antiviral activity in the background of chronic FB. So if you're going to use JNG, six, if you have the various subjective dose being tried, 25, 75, 125, 150, and 250, if you're going to subject, that shows evidence of your decline of your HPV DNA levels if you're going to subject the patient with JNG6379. So what is going to happen? The next line of molecule by your immune system manipulating. What are you going to do, your immune modulators? So if you're going to look into the entry of your immune modulators, like interferon, which is going to have a predominant pathway, what is going to happen that innate and adaptive immune response is going to take on in this area. So I will be talking into this. What are the various toll-like receptors which is being predominantly involved in this? If you're going to look into this toll-like receptor, this receptor 7 and 8, which is going to have a predominant role, but they're all the part of interleukin family. They'll be having a specific recognition pathogen associated molecular pot patterns, which are being having unique two pathogens, the specific ligand-based interaction. It is going to to activate your innate immune response, a pro-inflammatory response, and the release of anti-inflammatory antiviral cytokines. Once the antiviral cytokines is going to get released, which shows once the HPV replication, definitely it's going to come down with your tall like receptor activation. So if you are going to have more of HPV as a positive in the initial phase, your HPV replication is going to be very high. That's why you, there is high level of positivity, high level of infection, and this tall like receptor activation pathway is going to set in your HPV replication definitely will be coming down. So there are the various receptors are being done, given. For example, TLR4 to 10 prominent receptor for this is lipopolysaccharide or gram-positive ligands. And apart from that, your viral DNA, bacterial flagellin, all these things are being there for this tall like receptors. If you're going to look into this, the TLR7 agonist, that's what the main area for me to discuss now. See, it's being targeted from your Kupfer cell in the hepatic sinusoid. From there, you'll be going to enter into the dendritic cells. If you're going to look into the pathway, your innate through adaptive response, your B cell expansion is going to happen, your NK cell expansion is going to happen, followed by your T cell expansion is going to happen, and the jack start effective signaling pathway is going to set in in the pathway of hepatocyte. And once it's going to set in, what is going to happen? Your antiviral Antiviral effect of release proteins is going to get activated. Once the antiviral effect is going to get activated, there may be a prong antiviral activity. Your HPV replication is going to come down with this cytokine. So, if you are going to look into this, your interferon, alpha, beta, delta, as well, these things will be having a replication if you are going to inject your large amounts of uh, your recombinant cytokines that shows severe systemic side effects can be there but none successfully tested or shown to have better efficacy than interferon alpha as of now in various clinical trials but we can be able to establish as a day progresses so tlr7 what they mentioned in that it's going to have an activation virus specific tlr which may have a type 1 interferon like so predominantly IF and alpha, alpha or IF and beta. So what is going to happen? Once the patient is going to have interferon beta, it will be having a, it will be going to inhibit your HPV replication by your destabilization of pre-genomic RNA and interfering with the assembly. So these are all more theoretical for discussion. So if you're going to look into that, we need to block there. We need to target this. We need to target this jack start pathway. We need to establish a prolonged antiviral activity for this tall like receptors uh, activation to set in. What is this? Uh, for example, what is this D six nine six two zero D S nine six two zero? Nothing but a TL, TL, TLR seven agonist, which is normally to be given in oral form. It showed a strong antiviral effect as of now in animal studies and a too long reduction in HPV viremia. If you're going to have a too long reduction, predominantly being focused in chimpanzees, and also shown a CCD DNA. Also, if you're going to use in this uh, oral TLR seven agonist, can be reduced at increased doses. It also decreases your HPV levels and and also a anti hbs zero conversion can be happened so this g62 uh, ges 9620 what is the form of kinetic and dynamic if you're going to look into this if you're going to subject down 0.3 milligrams to 1 milligrams and that shows a dose dependent induction of your interferon 
your cytokines and chemokines and interferon stimulated gene so we'll be going to stimulate which is going to stop which is going to deaccelerate your uh epidemic b viral activation in your system in your various peripheral blood and liver so no adverse reactions as of now major reactions have been reported in various animal models being tried so gs9620 this tnr7 agonist trial if you're going to use this one milligrams and also at the rate of around two milligrams to do at the rate of around four weeks of interval and 14 weeks of therapy if you use the hb dna levels and you need to monitor your flow cytometry for your for evaluation of your lymphocyte population and also you need to look for your isg gene transcript levels all those things, if you want to monitor the progression, these are all being tried in various clinical trials and mainly for the research purposes being tried if you want to target this for animal models. So if you are going to look into this uh, 9620 trial, what I may mention, the HPV, DNA, all those things is going to have a set target and uh, various results if your hpv dna levels in serum and liver it is going to come down followed by therapy and your hpv ag levels is going to come down and serial conversion is possible to happen and your dna levels is also going to come down if you're going to subject the patient with 1 mg or 2 mg per kg and this 9620 trial shows the on concluding shows a maximal mean protection in serum viral load of around 2.2 longs if you're going to continue the patient for two to four months and hpv ag hpsag HPV PC positive receptors also uh, hepatocytes also that shows evidence of reduction but human studies are had to proven in this TLR7 and TLR8 so what is this TLR8 it's predominantly uh, so what is going to happen in your know, once a patient is going to have a chronic FB what is going to happen the impairment in your peripheral blood mononuclear cells is going to set in for a TLR8 pathway and for example, if you're going to take a HBAG negative patients, we treated with this 48 weeks of close, I mean, 48 weeks duration of pegylated interferon, a TLR8 messenger RNA level could discriminate between these who achieved a complete response and those who did not show a much of response. So if you're going to look into that, the TLR rate manipulation will show a got a, uh, I mean, got a I mean, better potential role if you're going to have a targeted therapy for this condition. And immune system manipulation, what are you going to do, followed by adapting an immune response. There is various molecules, what is called that you checkpoint inhibitors. So once, what is this checkpoint inhibitors? You need to target the three areas. One is to prevent your programmed cell death and associated T lymphocyte activation. And next to that, your lymphocyte activation gene pathway and next to, next to that your t-cell immunoglobulin domain so what is going to happen this checkpoint inhibitor is going to reinvigorate the function of your pre-existing viral immunity pre-existing antiviral immunity is going to be reinvigorated if you're going to use this checkpoint the t-cell phenotypic they exhausted because of this hepatitis b virus what is going to happen their t-cell phenotype is going to get exhausted the exhausted phenotype will be overexpressed so the competitive inhibitors pathway is going to that's what i've been discussed being sitting in and your immunosuppressive cytokines your chemokines mention your exhausted phenotype if you're going to use this produced by a tolerogenic prone innate immune cells and T-regulatory cells that can enrich in the liver of this chronic hepatitis B virus related patient. So a mouse model with a persistent HPV and anti-PD-1, I mean uh, anti and, uh, I mean, uh, program cell death one antibody, if you're going to use, it can able to reverse your immune cell dysfunction and it can able to help your clear, uh, partially can able to help to clear the infection. So your anti uh, I mean, the program death inhibitor can have a significant effect predominantly by restoring your T cell responses. So, for example, if you're going to subject the patient with nivolumab based therapy, program death inhibitor pathway, if you're going to look into that, mainly been tried in chronic HCV, a significant reduction in HCV, but increased interest also being re reported as a checkpoint inhibitor that shows evidence to be used even in patients with chronic FB as being done by Galena et al. in 2013. So apart from these various inhibitors, CCDNA level, all those things we are going to discuss at the, I mean, um, uh, for the potential type to target, there are some newer concepts for this therapeutic vaccination to consider. If you're going to look into this, 
go mainly to express your apparatus B. What is this therapy? It's going to induce or reinvigorate your T cell waste pathway from your antigen presenting cells, your polymerase envelope. What is going to happen? These T various mechanisms by this, what is going to happen? The processing of this antigen, the professional antigen presenting cells can prime new and reactivate your HBV specific T cells if you are going to use this therapeutic vaccination. And this is the structure of the new recon antigen what they mean try gs4774 and if you're going to consider this it contains various large s protein and it's an and m protein and i would say a core protein is being predominantly involved in this and if you're going to use this gs4774 vaccine which we predominantly now consider in mice it stimulates your t-cell response Responses and also it's going to target for hbs agsp cag and hbx and stimulate your hbv specific cd8 t cell so there are from few studies been tried in human clinics trial also if you are going to look into this the paper been recently taken from this if you are going to use at a dose of around 10 to 40 uh, around 80 if you are going to subject the patient around 80 60 patients if you are going to use there might be evidence shows that if you are going to use slightly at a higher dose if you are, that shows evidence a uh, complete response which means uh, around 7 to 10 percent of the population will be having more of response to this and more of immunogenicity potential is going to get a time if you are going to use this 4774 vaccination. So what is the main conclusion in this 4774? It may be safe in your healthy subjects, but few injections right reactions can be reported. Weekly and monthly regimens are there, but we need to rigorous immune response. But we need still more larger studies as by Gilead et al. What we mentioned in the Gilead group of study. So it was designed to contain more proteins of the HPV genome than previous viral vaccine candidates. So the second one is mainly based upon your DNA based vaccines. So, what are the targets for the DNA based vaccines? If you're going to look into that, it is going to induce your immoral as well as cellular immune response. It is also going to activate your T helper pathway and cytotoxic responses. All these things being activated and by your DNA based vaccines also. Now, there are several new areas to discuss about you know, simple concepts being tried, like di substituted sulfonamides. If you're going to use this, what is going to happen and uh, it is going to inhibit your ccc dna production if you're going to use not 975 and not 346 it's going to inhibit your cc dna and it is going to interfere with your circular dna conversion to cc dna and also it's going to inhibit your de novo cc dna formation so there are certain other molecular reaction molecular pathways like lymphotoxin beta receptor pathway what they are going to do in that this is being taken from your 2014 paper. It's mainly by YLT beta R agonist. It is going to induce the degradation of CCD DNA and activating your upper B deaminase pathway. It's going to inhibit and degrade your DNA, CCD DNA level. So that shows some evidence by lymphotoxin next area of level of therapy. And now the site-specific nucleases can also be considered in the management of HPV DNA. So what is this site specific? If you're going to look into that, mainly it will be breaking your DNA homologs, followed by your homolog repair and followed by your non homolog end joining. So your homolog of DNA repairing and DNA joining, which will lead to inhibit your viral replication. That is the main area of interest to discuss about the nucleases that engineered nucleases bind to DNA and it is going to double strand break. So if you're going to look into this pathway, mainly by zinc finger nucleases, and this is one by <coughs> transcription activated nucleases. If you're going to look into that zinc finger and transcription activator, the various mega nucleases, all these derivatives of this CRISPR pathway, which is that it's a cluster regulatory interspace, which is going to be predominantly involved. So there might be evidence of your matching gene sequence is going to get happen if you're going to use the most commonly desired endonuclease pathway. And once this CRISPR or Cas9 system, it may be having evidence of disrupting your intrahepatic G HPV genome. So what is needed? So we need to have a significant reduction, but not shows you have a complete elimination of your hepatitis B status. Next to that, 
what is this new concept called epigenetic the ccc dna is subject to epigenetic regulation and followed by acetylation and methylation of its associated histones will be the an attractive option to shut down the ccd active activity so if you want to shut down the ccd dna you need to alter the epigenetic regulatory pathways and one simple entity one more thing i want to come uh, discuss with you what is this micro rna see micro rna it is one of the major pathway towards a role for hpv RNA cure. So once this micro RNA is going to get down regulated, which is going to happen predominantly in your HPV viral replication, what is going to happen once it's going to get down regulated, the cyclin G pathway is going to get activated. So once the cyclin G pathway is going to get activated, there will be your cyclin G and your uh, in P53 pathway is going to get involved and followed by your your abrogates your P53 mediated inhibition of your HPV replication. So what is going to happen? The most abundant liver specific microRNA levels will be going to come down with this hepatitis B viral replication. So there are multiple modality of action for this microRNA 120. That is why the main area of target nowadays for most of us to consider this line of therapy because microRNA will be predominantly involved in your hepatic function, your hepatocytic function and followed by your regulation of your hepatitis B also will be involved in regulation of your uh, hepatitis C virus and also being involved in your neoplastic transformation. So to prevent this epitocellular carcinoma transformation, all these things, this microRNA is being having a potential target therapy if you want to consider this for your management. And next to that, what is this HBV polymerase based therapy? So if you're going to look into that, the main therapies are being against reverse transcriptase. So it contains, it consists of multiple, what is this reverse transcriptase from DNA to RNA and reverse transcriptase mainly from RNA, you need to stop the DNA. So we need to inhibit the reverse transcriptase pathway. We need to target against this reverse transcriptase. That's why the ribonuclease H activity has to come down in essential for the viral replication. The ribonuclease H inhibitors could also be used to de uh, develop combination approaches targeting the viral life cycle. And various HPS agent release inhibitors have also been tried nowadays. But this, what is the problem which absorbs the potentially neutralizing antibodies? It may have immune exhaustion and also having a tolerance effect. If you're going to look into this REP2139, it may be having a potent role in preventing the release of HPS AG, decrease your HPS AG levels and potent zero conversion. But it is going to, whether it is going to cause your detrimental accumulation of your HBS AG inside your hepatocyte is there or not, it's still a questionable issue to be addressed if you're going to use this HBS AG release inhibitor. So as of now, it's not much of a beneficial role has been considered. And nowadays, other, other trials like targeting your antisense oligonucleotides. What is this? If you're forming your RNA-RNA duplex or if you're going to form a DNA-RNA hybrid, so it is mainly by a short synthetic nucleic acid fragment which is going to bind to your target RNA sequences. What is going to happen? Once it's going to be modified, that shows evidence of affinity, stability and stability specificity for the target that you're going to use. So the main area is phosphoethinamine based uh, antisense organucleotides, what are being used in duct HPV model being tried that shows the reduction of viremia, your intrahepatic B DNA as well as RNA levels is going to come down and followed by a sufficient core proteins also is going to get calmed down if you are going to use this antisense organucleotides being tried in this trial. And this is all the outline of your various drugs as I've been discussed with the newer molecules like entry inhibitors like Metrolex B, your RNA interfering pathway, your capsid assembly modulator has been inhibitor pathway. This is the outline various phase preclinical trials have been going on your nucleotide various new nucleotide analogs like your pro drug of chinophobe like agx10009 and also your basic for way like lb838030 all these things if you're going to look into that various new therapeutic vaccine targets like as I discussed with you all, the DNA target also being a GS4774, TG1050, multiple non-adenovirus based pathway tried in the management, in the protocol, in the upcoming area for this hepatitis B virus.
before concluding if you are going to look into the phase no single cure no single trial proven to have a significant beneficial role to eradicate this hepatitis b virus completely so we need to target this area to whom you are going to subject how long you are going to treat what to say what is the presentation for this patient what are the various complications whether you are going to treat the patient with acute hepatitis b or if you are going to treat the patient with chronic hepatitis or in the background of renal derangement or in the background of compensated or decompensated cirrhosis or in the background of any other associated complications or in the background of pregnancy status all these things to be assessed properly if you want to treat this hepatitis b virus it's very systemic dynamic disease and one of the complex structural integrity to be analyzed and targeting and if you're going to use your main motive you need to bring down ALT, histological conversion, serological conversion, and you need to target your biochemical conversion. All those things has to be ascertained properly. Your fibrosis level has to down target by more than two. If you're going to be having fibrosis of more than 11, that shows significant evidence of cirrhosis. You need to target the fibrotic, at least a two point reduction of fibrosis has to happen. If you're going to treat the patient with this, evidence b viral based therapies and you need to reduce the risk of progression the ultimate aim you need to prevent the patient with cancer related events epidemic carcinoma progression so we need to control it's very well controllable so early screening early diagnosis most of the patient do screening for all like retroviral patients that's the most important thing to target and chinofever alafenamide definitely can be considered as a newer great drug with great efficacy and with relatively few adverse events like what is going to happen with other molecules like nchkw so risk of scc definitely is going to low if you're going to initiate the patient on adequate treatment and you have to what is the age criteria you're going to decide all the things to be ascertained and cure for hbv is still on the horizon horizon with combination therapy will require several drugs with different mechanisms will require both antivirals and immunostimulators like what are the base therapy what are the newer trials and what are the various new vaccination being tried if you want to manage a patient with chronic hepatitis b it's one of the complex phenomena to understood and i would like to thank you all for this patient listening with this i would like to rest my presentation i'm happy to take up your questions if anything is there to take on Hello, thank you very much, doctor, for your long yes. session, long scientific session. It was very much interesting and you have uh, briefed all emerging options for the treatment of hepatitis B. Now we have some questions from across India. Many doctors are asking some questions. Shall I go through some questions, sir? Yes, sir. So how to go myself in the very small that the photo mode? Uh, you want to see the question, is, sir? No, I'll no, no, no. We can, we can read the questions. What I'll, are the various questions? I'll read the question. I'll yes. read the questions and uh, you can address them. So, sure. so, one doctor from Mumbai is asking, can you guide post-exposure for flaxis for hepatitis B virus? So, if you're going to expose, if you're going to look for the patient with post-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis B viruses, we need to see whether the patient is being vaccinated or unvaccinated, sir. If the patient has been previously vaccinated, you need to see whether the patient is having anti-HBS levels. So anti-HBS levels, if it is going to be more than 10, that shows you know, evidence of significant protection. So we can wait, watch and monitor. But if your anti-HBS, if it is not going to be more than 10, definitely you need to go for vaccination. But even with that, previously, if you're not going to vaccinate a patient with chronic, uh, maybe vaccinate a patient, and now you're going to harbor a patient with injection, uh, hepatitis B virus positive patient, that shows evidence you need to go for hepatitis B virus vaccination along with hepatitis B immunoglobulin has to be addressed in two different sites simultaneously has to be addressed sir. Sir, second question from Hyderabad. In a hepatite, a HIV positive patient, if HBS AG is positive without history of jaundice with HBV DNA level less than 1000, what next to be done? See, in all as a one very nice question, sir. Uh, so, what is the main thing if you want to target a patient with hepatitis B and hepatitis, I mean, HIV virus? You can consider you can continue your antiretroviral based therapy. But one thing you need to add in your antiretroviral based therapy the targeting the molecules for HBV also. You need to add either lamivudine based therapy or you need to consider the patient with. You know,
based regimen which is being well available and even if the cd4 count whatever levels if it is there in the background of hiv you need to monitor we need to consider the patient and you need to have a serial monitoring for your hpv reactivation and other process if it is going to happen and your chinophobia or lamivudine all those things to be added in the armamentarium if you want to consider a patient with hpv along with uh, hiv status for managing your patients thank you sir uh, next question is from uh, chennai sir doctor if yes. patient viral load continue to be very high in lags but alt ast le uh, levels are in normal range what to do what is the question sir i couldn't get you alt alc levels in normal range and hb dna viral, lags viral load is in lags but alt yes. ast level is in normal range what to do we need to see what is the level of fibrotic index we need to see what is the level of other parameters you need to look into your alt ast levels if it is going to be normal and then even if the patient is going to be having more than two and you need to see whether the patient is being having hb eag positive or hb eag negative status and based upon that if the patient even if the patient is going to be hb eag negative even if all the parameters is normal definitely there is high point of you to start the patient with treatment in this modality to consider sir Sir, another question from Delhi, Doctor. In case of uh, HBV and TB co-infection, which one should be treated first, and how to monitor the other one? HBV and TB. TB. Tuberculosis. I couldn't get it. Ah, uh, tuberculosis. So. Sir, some interruption is there. Hello, Pradeep. Can you help me? To target your, uh, you're planning to consider the treatment, sir. So. Hepatitis B virus also to be treated and your tuberculosis also to be addressed if you're planning to manage a patient with HBV positive status. And you need to add, simultaneously, you need to see your baseline parameter that what I've been as, uh, discussed with you in the initial presentations. Okay, sir. Next question is from Pune. For a young female, if HBS AG is positive, pre-surgical, with a strong family history, what next to be done? HBSAG positive pre surgical with a strong family history, always you need to treat the patient for hepatitis B virus. Because if the patient is having strong family history of hepatitis B virus, if the patient is having family history of hepatitis cellular carcinoma, irrespective of the focus, why my choice as per but some guidelines, Apacel and ASLD, we mentioned different guidelines, but ideally to start the treatment for this kind of patient scenario is one of the most important considerations to go on, sir. Sir, another question from Hyderabad. If patient with HBV related cirrhosis has functional cure, should we continue antivirals? HBV related as functional cure, we need to consider that and we need to continue antivirals because CCD, DNA, even then if it is a potential target, achieving a functional cure doesn't mean that you are being having a complete elimination. So you need to target, you need to continue the treatment definitely is one of the most important thing uh, for consideration, sir. Sir, another question from Faridabad. How to approach follow-up patient found to be HBS AG positive on routine checkup? So yeah, incidentally detected asymptomatic HBS AG positive. That's what I've been trying to mention. So once you are being yes, asymptomatic, sir. as what I've been discussed with you, if you are going to... Uh, uh, based upon your other parameters, you need to see your ALT levels. Also, you need to see your fibrotic index. Also, you need to see whether your ultrasound abdomen and you need to look for your other parameters. You need to assess your clinical presentation and you need to look for any other complication of CLD, whether it is there or not. If nothing is there, ALT, ASG parameter, everything is fine. If your fibrotic index is almost less than six, if your parameters are normal, serial monitoring definitely can be done. If you are not going to have any major immunocompromise or any other major complications uh, for you to target on. Sir, another question from Visa. Doctor, what is the percentage of HBS AG loss on long-term treatment? 
HBS AG long term treatment, the percentage will be very high because we most of the patients we HBS AG zero conversion will be around one to two percent of the population. So most of them who have been having a chronic hepatitis B like presentation, most of the infections will be acquiring prenatally. So there is high possibility for you to go for a long term treatment. More than fifty, to, more than sixty to seventy percent of the population to go for long term treatment in the background of hepatitis B, which is going for chronicity. Okay, sir. Sir, another question from Hyderabad. If co-infection with the HCV, which one should be treated first? See, the problem is if you're going to target your HCV and if you're going to target your HBV, both are separate guidelines to be. You need to start your DAA, direct antiviral. And if you're going to start your DAA, there is some possibility for your hepatitis B worsening status within weeks of uh, initiating your DAA. Uh, but you need to initiate the treatment separately for your HPV. And also you need to combine the treatment and you need to monitor serially. Once serially, even for your HPV, I mean worsening and also for your hepatitis C virus worsening, all these things you need to monitor serially if you want to subject the patient for this HPV as well as HCV coin. So both has to be addressed simultaneously. That's the most important thing to conclude. Sir, another uh, question from Karnul. Can we switch all the TDF patients to TAF for safety costs? No much of issues, not much of necessary because very few adverse effects even we being the way, for example, if you are going to use genophome, there might be having evidence of renal malformation, renal events, pancreas osteomyelitic changes and few cases of lactic acidosis being reported with that, but no much of auxiliary indications for you to switch on con considering genophobic uh, or alafenamide. But once a patient is pregnant or if you are going to subject the patient with enchegivir initially, once a patient is pregnant, there is high possibility, then you need to take on uh, for genophobic uh, Rather than I mean, tenofovir like drugs, but switching over from tenofovir to tenofovir alpha med is I mean, uh, absolutely not indicated for most of the patients when you're going to manage a patient with chronic FB scenario. So, another question from Puducherry when to start HBV treatment in pregnancy? HBV D, see, main thing if you're going to have uh, a good question, so main thing you need to see your HBV DNA levels. If it is going to be more than two lakhs, so uh, that is high possibility if you're worsening of LFT, all those things are going to happen. You need to start the patient immediately on therapy if the patient is having HPV DNA more than two lakhs. That's the most important thing. And once you're going to initiate the patient and at around 28 to 32 weeks of gestational period is the most important thing to consider. And once you're going to initiate the patient with HPV treatment, uh, postpartum also in three months, we can consider the therapy and followed by, we need to consider vaccination with hepatitis B immunoglobulin, along with FDSB vaccine to your newborn baby. So initiating treatment with the tenofovir based regimen in the background of pregnancy is one of the most important thing to consider. Sir, another question from Vijayawada. Entacavir resistant patient, multidrug entacavir plus TAF or monotherapy of TAF is enough? Entacavir resistant patient, we need to switch on to other line of therapy. That's the most thing, but we need no need to combine two antivirals. But we can go for either chinofovir or you can go for chinofovir alpha med. That's monotherapy can be considered. And also, you need to look for serial levels like what I've been discussing. We need to look for your fibrotic index, and also you need to look for your LFT and other parameters to see whether it is responding or not. So when you're going to decline the patient's primary non-responsive, that's the most important thing when you're subject in the patient because primary non-responsive means even after treating the patient with F4 hepatitis B virus after a period of around 24 weeks and if there is going to be a reduction of your log levels if it is going to be less than one that shows evidence of your primary non-responsive status so in those scenarios we need to in those scenarios we can consider this alternating molecule but no much of potential beneficial effects if you are going to combine two antiviral therapies for a patient with chronic HPV as of now what has been addressed Thank you, sir. Another question from Chennai. Uh, HB is AG uh, positive patient not affected by COVID. Is it true, sir? Because most of the time, if you're going to, it's not absolutely true, but most of the time, not only for hepatitis B virus, even if the patient is going to have HIV virus, if you're going to subject the patient with antiviral support, that shows evidence of your HIV replication, other things is going to be completely calmed down, like that other viral pathway entries, which is predominantly based upon your RNA and DNA based molecules. So definitely there might be having some potential beneficial role if you're going to consider this antivirals for 
a patient who are being already on treatment with this uh, uh, HIV or hepatitis B virus related scenarios, other viral entry definitely will be having a slightly lower risk for consideration. But even then, always you should remember if you're targeting HBV, if you're targeting your HIV, you in the background of your immune compromised status, that shows evidence of your worsening of COVID infection. Still, some few case reports in the background of HBV being reported in various trials are being given. Thank you very much, sir. One last question from Chennai. If HGVOT and SGBT is normal and USG abdomen is normal for initiating chromotherapy for ovarian cancer, what to do in HBS AG positive patient? Uh, for initiating, uh, I mean chemotherapy. Huh? For initiating yes, chemotherapy, for, uh, yeah. If you want to initiate chemotherapy in the background of ovarian malignancy, in the background of hepatitis B virus positive. Always you need to start the patient on antiviral support because initiating chemotherapy, there is high possibility for you to go for your reactivation for your HPV virus. So even if the virus has been previously zero converted, there is evidence for a reconversion of the virus to happen. That may that shows HPV AG negative to HPV AG positive status can happen, which may predispose to infective pathology or worsening of your LFT can happen. So in the background of immunocompromised status, if you're going to subject the patient with immunosuppressive therapy, you need to start the patient with antiviral support and one of the strong pointed to consider. Sir, thank you very much, sir. With this, we have closed all the questions and you have brought a very good information, new information about HBV management, sir. Thank you very much thank for you. your valuable thank time you. and thank, uh, thank you very much, much for uh, long scientific sessions, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. And, we are uh, thank, Eric, you all. thank you very much, all the audience who have been participated. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.